30 now, so we will be resuming. And yeah. uh, my name is Rajma Sufi. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to the new, new people who joined. Uh, we are at session two of our mini conference today, and uh, it will go um, for about two hours, but um, we will be hearing from um, some of the um, authors um, of chapters in the book. Um, first will be Kieran Durkin, who is from York University and the author of The Radical Humanism of Eric Fromm, a wonderful book. And then we'll hear from Alessandra Spano from University of Catania, writer on Marx, Hegel, and feminism. And last will be Peter Hudis from Oakton Community College, author of Franz Fanon, philosopher of the barricades. Um, so let us start with Kieran Durkin. Hello guys, can you hear me? Okay, I hope you can. Um, I have a two-year-old who is currently vomiting wildly, so if I have to leave at any point, um, that would be the reason. Hopefully not during my talk, um, at least. I thought I'd um, like to start by making uh, a connection to a couple of conversations I came across in the online community and on um, Twitter in particular. These conversations were, were both initiated by leftist intellectuals. One was a young American academic who um, proclaims his um, identification with thinkers such as Louis Althusser, Theodore Adorno, Michel Foucault, Barry Spinoza, and so on. The other conversation was led by a Scottish activist intellectual, someone um, more organically connected, I guess, to social movements. But I think it's fair to say to um, movements on the, the anti-war and class reductionist left, and so uh, very much in the Cliffite and SWP tradition, um, which is still somewhat quite dominant over here in the UK. In the, the first conversation, the, the topic of discussion was the need, as the person uh, saw it, to be wary of people who talk about practice, or even worse, as far as he was concerned, um, those who talk about praxis. Um, and these people, he claimed, were, you know, were merely bad theorists, masquerading as good theorists, so theorists who essentially fail to um, uphold the autonomy of theory and who thereby contribute to inflated claims of agency on uh, the part of what I think he clearly considers the elusive revolutionary subject. And it struck me that this, this worldview um, bears very much of a, of a similarity and a kind of non-incidental resemblance to that of Theodore Adorno, who at the outset of his book, Negative dialectics, his, you know, his major career defining work, reinterprets Marx's famous um, 11th thesis on Feuerbach on the basis that, as he saw it, the moment to realize philosophy had been missed and that we therefore needed to refrain from even really thinking about revolutionary social transformation until such a time. Uh, as when objective, the objective and the subjective conditions have, have made this, this realiza realization possible uh, once again. The second of the Twitter threads that, that caught my attention, um, that of the, the class reductionist activist intellectual, was concerned with trying to pull apart the claim that anti racist politics acts in. I'm sorry, um, Karen, we can't hear you. Guys, have I been out for a while? Just for a few seconds. Okay, I'm not sure exactly where, but I think I was talking about the second Twitter thread that I uh, had come across um, of this kind of anti, uh, class reductionist activist intellectual. He was critiquing the idea that 
that black and kind of anti-racist politics itself is in some way intrinsically connected to Marxism. So he kind of said that this idea was you know, completely a misnomer, um, a fundamental misunderstanding revealed as such by the fact that you know, anti-racist politics appears entirely compatible with liberal bourgeois capitalist politics itself. And in, in support of this, he pointed to the fact, as he saw it, that anti-racism has become an important element in the legitimation of power, that it has become co-opted into kind of liberal strategies of governance and neoliberal politics in general. And he made pointed reference here to um, the recent and protracted anti-Semitism scandal in British politics involving the Labour Party and, and Jeremy Corbyn in particular as an instance, uh, as he saw it, of anti-racist politics being utilised as part of a neoliberal attack on the return after many years, it has to be said, to something at least resembling class politics in the UK. So um, I thought I would try to use the substance of, of my chapter in the in the Dean of Sky volume and, and the, the Marxist humanism that um, uh, of Dean of, of Sky that I discussed there as background for opening a discussion on these ideas. I, ideas that I think you'll all recognise and have been touched on already that have quite a strong presence on, on the left today and that, that need to be critiqued and overcome in, in both thought and practice. So starting with the, the first discussion, which puts forward what I think we can call, you know, the, the professional Marxist position. It's clear that this goes completely against, of course, one of the central kind of facets of Diana Skye's Marxist humanism, you know, her resolute commitment to the connection and the deep interpenetration of, of theory and, and practice. What is central to Diana Skye's Marxist humanism um, uh, we can think of it, I would suggest, as even you know, the normative idea behind it is this notion of universality uh, that Kevin and Paul mentioned earlier, this need for human wholeness and the need to be, to be fully human, to fully develop the humanity, in other words, of the, the all-round individual um, that she finds most clearly elaborated in Marx's 1844 manuscripts. And so this is a a humanist appropriation from the early Marx that that she kind of she she uh, uses time and time again, and that she describes as the pivot um, of Marx's entire critique of capitalism. So this identification of the fundamental denial of individual and social freedom that is both the precondition and also the continually reproduced result of the capitalist production process. Um, and one of the, the central aspects of this denial of this need, of course, is the division between mental labour on the one hand and manual labour on the other, which is a division, I think, that we can see in both um, a narrower and also a broader sense. In the, in the narrower sense, it's, it's, you know, it's clear that certain groups of workers experience um, greater levels of autonomy and intellectual fulfillment at work, not to mention being um, better remunerated um, uh, through the relatively enhanced ability that they have to use their mental capacities, their reason, their creativity, etc. But in, in the main, of course, millions upon millions of workers all over the world are denied this opportunity almost entirely. And even those who are not denied it to this extent are only given a narrowly circumscribed scope um, in which to do so. In the, the broader sense, and, and, and I guess the more crucial sense for what I want to say here, it, it, it's clear that, that capitalism affects uh, separation in the case of every worker, so every person who sells their labour power. And this is a separation, in other words, from what I think we can call the, the social unity of mental and manual labour, which is precisely this separation from the free, creative and social practice of doing things and thereby from our species being in its most profound sense of individual and collective realize, realization. And it's, it's this um, 
that is the central criticism that Marx makes, of course, of alienated labour in the 1844 manuscripts, and that provides at the same time the basis to his critique of commodity fetishism in, in Das Kapital. So he calls this separation from our creative social being, and I quote, the real generation process of capital. So that which fundamentally structures what he makes clear is our enchanted topsy-turvy world where subject and object are inverted, where dead labor dominates living labor. And uh, a process, and um, this is a process incidentally, which you know, Dunia, Dunia Skaya brings up uh, so forcefully in relation to both private and also state capitalism. And, and, and why I think this is important because is that in this sense, it's clear that um, even though oppression in terms of mental and manual labor exists to varying degrees, uh, depending on various professions and places in, in, the, in the labor hierarchy and the hierarchy and in capitalism in general, the key point, and I think this is Marx's key point, is that we are all oppressed subjects. So everyone who sells their labor power is oppressed to the very conditions that structure our basic social existence in the world, the, the denial of freedom in, in, in relation to uh, free association and, and creative labor. Um, so yeah, obviously this is a, a, fairly, a fairly elemental, um, an elementary, sorry, point in Marx, but it's one that is routinely passed over um, in the left so much so that it, it tends to become forgotten in, in most critiques of capitalism, certainly most mainstream critiques of capitalism. And so one of the main benefits of, of the Marxist humanist position, as I see it, is that this element is front and center. It's at the front and center of the Marxist humanist analysis, reminding us that you know, we're, we are all, again, to the extent to which we sell our labor power to survive, that we all share something fundamentally in common, something quite terrible, actually, and something that denies us all our universality and human wholeness in this regard. But this, this idea is helpful in another sense too, I think, in that returning to the, the, the Twitter conversation I mentioned at the outset, in that it speaks in turn to the professional Marxists, so those who remain in the realm of theory and who, who posit this kind of disconnection between their situation on the one hand and the situation of the workers on the other. So um, these theorists may be philosophers, they may be sociologists, they may be political scientists, um, but which, whichever discipline they, they hail from, they tend to be people who spend most of their time studying order, studying norms, studying rules, structures, social reproduction and power. And that in that process, they tend to reproduce and replicate these very forms of determination in their accounts of, of social life and social existence. Uh, I think as a result of this, they, there tends to be this uh, creation of an us and them division that serves both to justify their existence as theorists on the one hand, uh, uh, and at the same time to kind of valorize this notion of the, the inactivity or the integration of the masses. Um, and that this has consequences, of course, in relation to the notion of a vanguard, vanguard party, uh, which we may come on to discuss in the in in the subsequent discussion. But I think it's it's one of the the great merits of Dania Skaya, as well as her critique of vanguardism, that she punctuates this kind of self-valorization on the part of the theorist when she declares, and to quote, "There is nothing in our thought, not even in the thought of a genius, that." has not previously been in the activity of the common man or, or the common person. And what's vital, I think, about this account is that theory here is something that is rooted in our concrete experiences and activities in the world, and which is fundamentally thereby connected to the notion of this denial of universality that, that marks us in various um, um, but nevertheless, related ways, and it simply can't be wished away. 
and because this is so, um, Dina, Dina Skyer's Marxist humanist focus helps to deepen an already dialectical position. It insists that, as was mentioned earlier, we should not be seen as you know inert objects that merely act as bearers of structure, but rather as active and non-mechanical beings um, in the sense that our need for universality, this, this felt sense of a need for wholeness and creative participation, free association in the world, it's never fully extinguishable, stemming as it, as it does from um, the conditions, the very conditions, I should say, that, that constitute the dehumanization of our existence and that one in the same time from the basis of, of capitalist social relations. So whenever this kind of denial of, of human wholeness exists, uh, exists, I think there will, there will be a resistance on the, on the dialectical kind of view of, of this, the dialectical humanist view. And this is a resistance that exists at various levels. It, it of course, waxes and wanes in terms of active struggles, but there is also evidence, clear evidence of connections, of continuity, of developments between these struggles. So it's quite clear to see that lessons are learnt in terms of the previous struggles of the past and the theory that go with them, knowledge and practices are shared and developed as, as part of what um, you know, Marx described, I think, as the, the absolute movement of becoming. Um, all of which takes me on to the second Twitter conversation I had mentioned at the outset and the issue of of class reductionism. And again, it's, it's apparently, it's evident here and clear that, you know, Jenny of Skaya's Marxist humanism under stress on the need for universality helps to counter this kind of politics. Um, so she was able to expand on, on the notion of the revolutionary dialectic, by giving it in the process, you know, even greater vitality and depth. Um, and she does this, of course, by developing on Marx's writings in the 1844 manuscripts, Lenin's writings and actions in relation to the national question, um, the experiences that she herself had as an activist in the US working alongside black Marxists and, and others at the time. And what she shows in doing this is that even further dimensions of this need for universality have to be drawn out. In this case, you know, the basic recognition, recognition self and other recognition of one's humanity in the in the socioeconomic um, and also psychological realms that, that go with that. So um, I think what we see in this and what's significant is that we see this extension in the notion of universality that's there implicitly and to some degree, of course, explicitly in Marx. Um, and we see the extension in concrete and also philosophical terms. So, you know, going back to, to Hegel and Forbes, to Fanon, there is a dialectic between the demand for recognition, self-liberation, and human wholeness, all of which expands the notion of uh, a revolution in human relations that is the basis of the Marxian position. Um, but I guess to return to that second Twitter conversation and the class reductionist intellectual, the question will no doubt be posed, how does this relate to class and to the overthrowing of capitalism? And it's, it's, it's clear that you know, history tells us that struggles over identity and struggles over um, uh, recognition are not always connected to class struggle. But history also tells us, of, as I said earlier, connections and intersections and the coalescence and convergence of these struggles. Um, so I think the, the point, in, in, as, as, as Diana Sky has said, and I realize I'm, I'm close to time here, um, uh, in relation, she said this in relation to uh, the women's struggles of the 60s and 70s that she, she of course, was part of, is that though, the, though these particular struggles speak in, in many voices, they, they, they kind of carry within them in various ways what you call the revolutionary potential because they speak to dehumanized relationships and the shared sense of, you know, this need for universality, for human wholeness. Um, and a movement towards universality in one place awakens or has the potential to awaken consciousness of the need for universality in other places. Um, and in this sense, uh, you know, such movements, such struggles, such protests, I think we can see them as representing openings, kind of fissures in the seemingly dead kind of social 
objectivity of the world, some moments of rupture in the process of self-reproduction, um, and ultimately instance of, instances of self-liberation that, that speak to us all at some level. So the question is not merely, I think, how you know, black or feminist or LGBTI, etc. movements can speak to working class movements, but how class movements speak to them, or, or rather, how they each speak to one another. And um, as was covered uh, quite extensively in the, in the discussion in the first section, uh, there are obviously you know, myriad practical issues involved here. Um, but on a philosophical level, at least, I think we should follow Dana Skaya in, in, in kind of recognizing that she, she says, and I quote, the frozen lines of communication between black and white can be reopened only through a total philosophy of freedom, such as Marx's humanism, end quote. So Dina Skaya's Marxist humanism transcends class and other forms of reductionism and provides the basis at the same time of what she calls with, with, with nods to Gramsci and to, to Hegel, an absolute humanism, which is nothing other than the articulation needed to sum up a classless, non-racist, non-sexist society where truly new human relations self-develop. And yeah, with that, I think I'll stop. I could go on. Thank you. Um, and I also once uh, again want to take the opportunity to remind folks that the paperback of this book um, will not be out until 2023. So I've shared the uh, discount code in the chat once again at the beginning of the session. Um, and now we are moving to our second speaker. Alessandra Stana. Uh, let me make sure she can. There she is. Hi. Hi. Well, uh, first of all, first of all, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for uh, organizing uh, this uh, debate and inviting me to participate. I'm very, very proud and. Uh, honored to be part of this uh, wonderful discussion. Um, well, actually, the, um, the reflection I gave to the, to the, to the book we are uh, uh, talking about uh, um, was, uh, was titled uh, Unchaining the Dialect on the Trisol of Revolution, uh, Dunayevskaya's Discovery of Hegel in the Birth of Marxist Humanism. Um, I mean, the, the choice to focus on this specific moment uh, was uh, um, surely uh, linked to my interest in uh, Dunayevska in general, in Dunayevska's thought in general. So um, I think, uh, uh, yes, the choice was, uh, um, was uh, twofold. The, the, the reason was twofold. On the one hand, uh, surely, uh, because uh, this part, the, the, the part uh, of the, the, the very beginning of our, uh, of our Marxist humanism is uh, uh, less known, uh, since also it was often overlapped and uh, overshadowed by the, the figure of uh, C.L.R. James. And uh, uh, because, of course, uh, her thought will become uh, uh, very, very known um, to the world, uh, especially after uh, the publication of uh, Marxism and Freedom in 1958. Uh, but I, I uh, believe that it constitutes a crucial moment of her own self-development as a philosopher. Uh, we can say a genetic moment, a fertile uh, and uh, rich for what will be the path of political and philosophical growth of Marxist humanism that we are uh, discussing uh, tonight. Uh, we, and also the, 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 it was, it was uh, uh, said before uh, in, in the previous uh, uh, interventions. So, um, in fact, we can say that the 50s uh, were a quite turbulent phase in uh, Raya Dunayevskaya's uh, life. Uh, on the one hand, we see a definitive break 
uh, with Trotskyism in 1950, while on the other hand, uh, also the collaboration with uh, C.L.R. James and Grace Lee, which had lasted over a decade, uh, will reach a, a death end. Uh, however, it was also um, a phase uh, full of ferment because uh, while some experiences uh, come to an end, others uh, uh, began to germinate. Uh, we, we know that uh, between 1954 and 1955, uh, she founded a new political group, News and Letters Committees, and uh, how important is this uh, political experience in her own uh, life and thought. And the early 50s uh, also, um, in fact, also marked what uh, Peter, Peter Hoodis has uh, appropriately named like a philosophic break. Um, so in this expression, uh, um, we can find uh, a transition from the theory of state capitalism to the founding of Marxist humanist theory. Um, and uh, here we can find uh, um, like uh, um, a paradigm of her, of, her own, uh, of her own thought. That's why I think uh, it is important to focus, uh, to focus on it. Um, uh, in this transition, uh, we, can, uh, we can see both a break, but also an Aufhebung, a new stage in which the negation is uh, um, overcome on a, on a newer level and conserved, but at the same time opened to a new horizon, a new political and uh, um, political and uh, uh, theoretical horizon. Um, so um, it is not by chance <laughs> that uh, this passage uh, takes takes place for her under the light of the encounter with the Hegelian dialectic, in particular, in her grappling with Hegel's notion of absolute as a vision of the future, investigated from the point of view of the present. Uh, I, I can uh, say that uh, um, it is uh, quite impossible for her to divide uh, the, the political activism, the political engagement, engagement uh, um, from the theoretical, uh, uh, the theoretical work study research. They are uh, intertwined at the very root of both of them. It, it, and uh, uh, each part influences the, the other part uh, consistently. Um, so also in the in their Hegelian turn, in their, in their Hegelian the encounter uh, shared with the Hegel, uh, we can um, we can uh, see both philosophical and political grounds. Um, on the one end, of course, the context, the political context where she developed uh, her breakthrough, but at the same time, uh, the theoretical causes and consequences of her interpretation of Hegel. Uh, a Hegelian moment can uh, can be dated back. Uh, to 1953, when she writes the letters regarding Hegel's absolute that uh, she sent to Grace Lee. Um, even if uh, Dunayevskaya began uh, investigating dialectical thought uh, already when she, together with uh, Lee and James, uh, were in the Johnson Forest tendency in the late, in, in the 40s. In fact, they read and discussed uh, Lenin's uh, philosophical uh, notebooks of 1914-1915, uh, uh, experiencing the need to rethink the role of the party and the organizational forms in general, from Stalinism to American Trotskyism, that were seen by them as unable to read the real movement of history. During the 40s, Dunesca, James, and Lee carried out a sharp critique of Stalin's Soviet Union, as uh, it was already um, say, uh, said uh, in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, um, talk, uh, developing an, an original theory of state capitalism, challenging the position of Trotsky himself, who continued to see the USSR as a worker state, albeit degenerate, or Two of, of, of them identified Stalinism as a third way between socialism and capitalism, such as the, the bureaucratic collectivistic uh, uh, re, uh, red of the, um, of the Stalinist Russia. Um, but uh, what the Johnson Forrest tendency pointed out uh, was that it was not possible to understand the truth 
of the Stalinist society without keeping together in the analysis both the material relationship and production relations in order. So, um, uh, the, 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 the economic analysis uh, she developed of uh, Stalin's five years plans, uh, in which she wanted to penetrate the relationship between capital and labor, and uh, uh, where she found the secrets of governance of labor in, uh, in uh, Stalin's Russia, the way in which uh, um, hierarchies were produced in the working class in the working class with the aim of reproducing the capitalist command over labor but at the same time and i think this is uh, a very important point she never represented the workers as a, a a matter as an object on which dominion is simply applied on the contrary um, it was uh, she was always careful in grasping to in, in grasping the movement of resistance the tact the tactics of the workers even when they were played uh, on an individual base because um, because she read a uh, a political relevance in the in the uh, workers subservient uh, subse, subse, subversive <laughs> sorry uh, fluidity to escape the factory regime through mobility and uh, it uh, i think uh, uh, touch also the the um, the point of migrant laborers uh, uh, workers in this uh, in these days as she wrote in analysis of, in, in an analysis of russian economy in 19 42, uh, where she recalled somehow uh, the flight from plantation of African Americans and uh, the, their power that was displayed uh, in that okay, on that occasion and the role uh, this event, uh, this, this, this flight uh, actually um, exer um, produced in abolishing slavery. Uh, so uh, Dunesca's focus on the autonomy or in political relevance of workers' subjectivity is surely one of the most inno innovative aspects of her analysis of uh, USSR, uh, especially considering she understood the state capitalism not simply as a totalitarian exception or a manifestation of the Russian question, but uh, rather as a new phase of, the, of world capitalist development directly linked to the political situation in the United States. In the US, in fact, the 30s and the 40s uh, were uh, decades in which uh, uh, black workers were the real protagonists of a lot of wildcat strikes and creative forms of workers' revolt against the factory regime and the institutional and social racist oppression. Also against the form, the traditional forms of uh, uh, organization of the working class, that is the trade unions and the parties. Um, and at the same time, no party was able to understand their revolutionary role, um, the revolutionary role played by the autonomous mass movements. Uh, and that for, was for them clearly, uh, and for her especially, clearly linked to the critique of Stalinist Russia as a state capitalist. In other words, uh, in this phase, uh, Dunayevskaya challenged the very notion of class, what was uh, before I think uh, Kieran was talking about it. Because uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, econo economist and uh, sociological, sociological uh, interpretation of class, um, that she uh, overturned uh, in um, a subjective antagonist positioning as a self movement, as a creative self activity within a given relationship of domination. It was indeed necessary to see how it was shaped, uh, the, the very notion of class was shaped and crisscrossed by the emergence of racial and gender contradictions among the rank and file. So um, that's why they were uh, they were focused on uh, challenging uh, the concept of the party, and uh, um, since uh, its function was not uh, 
they were they were contesting the function the traditional function of the party as the 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 the, 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 the means of the politics uh, the, the the structure to politicize from the top uh, the grassroots movements uh, because uh, for Dunayevskaya the grassroots movements were already political in themselves, are already political in themselves. Uh, what they need is uh, to support, uh, to support this autonomous organization of uh, grassroots movements. This, per this uh, uh, perspective led Dunayevskaya to go beyond uh, the boundaries of uh, the category of state capitalism in a search for a theory capable of grasping and showing the real possibility of overcoming the present social relations. That's why uh, she decided to translate into English uh, Lenin's uh, Hegel uh, notebooks, uh, um, also influenced by the reading of uh, Herbert Marcuse's um, uh, uh, Reason and Revolution, and uh, the polemic role this book played in the Marxist debate that was at the time strongly influenced uh, by positivist and pragmatic uh, pragmatist approaches. Uh, uh, While well, at the same time, the, st the Stalinist censorship um, uh, against the Hegelian uh, was, was applied against uh, Hegelian parts of Marx's works. So for example, the chapter on fetishism of commodity in the first book of Capitali. And uh, all of these uh, uh, certainly reinforced uh, Dunayevskaya, um, the, um, in Dunayevskaya, the idea of the necessity to plunge into the dialectic that were that was uh, a key a key play a key place a key um, spot to 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 focus on um, so in the footsteps of Lenin she wanted somehow to to rethink Marxism, starting from its dialectical content in the very moment in which uh, she was, and they were experiencing uh, the, the, um, the, 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 an impasse, an impasse, because it seemed uh, to be unable, uh, the, um, the party and the political, uh, um, the political forms of our organization seemed to be unable to respond to counter-revolutionary counter forces of uh, within the uh, the revolutionary movement. So uh, when we, they were debating on uh, Lenin's notebooks, uh, Dunayevskaya claimed against James the relevance of the dialectic of the relationship between the essence and the appearance that. Man, meant uh, between spontaneity and organization. Uh, the latter cannot be simply abolished or reduced to the former because it has its own objectivity, because appearance itself is one of the determinations of the essence. Uh, Dunayevska disagreed with J James' uh, uh, reductionism because it placed the contradiction at the level of capital. Uh, without grasping how the revolutionary movement, movement itself can pass through it. Therefore, through the dialectical method, Dunesca starts to point out how it is not enough to get rid of anachronistic organizational forms to face the puzzle of the revolution and its subject. So the need to connect the theory and practice, subjectivity and objectivity will mark the I think uh, the, the, the next steps and all the the, the her uh, whole um, theoretical reflection, political reflection. Um, so um, even if we can say that uh, um, that the debates within the Don Johnson Forest tendency constituted their theoretical background, the urgency of a philosoph philosophical leap toward the foundation of Marxist humanism was the, the prior reason to break up the political and intellectual collaboration with James and Lee, who did not feel, did not, did not feel the same urgency and express their distance both from humanism and philosophical uh, approach, as it was clearly stated in state capitalism and world revolution. 
So uh, the philosophical um, breakthrough versed uh, burst, uh, um, in uh, uh, when in in, uh, in May 15 uh, in 1953 when Dunayevsky wrote two letters to Lee. Uh, on Hegel's absolute, mm, the first one were, uh, focus, was focused on uh, um, the final chapter of Hegel's uh, uh, science of logic on the absolute idea, while the second were, um, were drawn from uh, uh, philosophy of, um, from Hegel's logic. Um, but uh, what uh, uh, was uh, what the desire that we can read uh, within those pages is uh, uh, the desire for a philosophy uh, capable not only of indicating the negative character of Stalinist and economist Marxism, but also the capacity of grasping the subjectivity, the subjective novelty of mass on the move in history. So um, she was, uh, he, um, she see, um, so the, the absolute idea as the unity of leadership activity and grassroots activity, grassroots activity, um, a topic that is clearly uh, linked to the uh, to the to a, a humanistic reading uh, of Marxism, as also Pierre was uh, was underlining. They needed to overcome the division between. The, theory and practice is uh, linked uh, um, with the reflection of the division between a man manual and mental labor elaborated uh, in the in the 40s where she uh, where she was she was saying that workers cannot be j seen just as force but also as the reason of revolution uh, at the same uh, uh, in the same way political activity cannot and should, should not reproduce the hierarchy of the division of the division of labor. So uniting mental and manual labor as also she will, uh, will do in news and letters committees in uh, the, the very structure they, will, um, they decided to have. Um, so uniting mental and manual labor means overcoming the relationship of domination that lies behind this separation tackling the question of power directly in the, in, the, in, in, in the very process of becoming. But at the same time, this hierarchical power relationship lies within uh, the organizational forms of labor movement uh, that, that are at the service of the state planned capitalism. So in this sense, the focus on the problem of the party that uh, we, we have uh, seen uh, in this, uh, um, in this uh, in, in, that I was just mentioning before, uh, comes from a specific concern to challenge Stalinism and state capitalism as a form of counter-revolution which emerged within the revolution. And the party, on the one hand, is the historical negation of the revolution, but on the other hand, it is the possible independence of proletariat as a revolutionary organization of the worker reappropriation of power to transform reality. So um, that is to say that what is party for, uh, for Dunayevsky at the end of the day, uh, probably is just the, 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 the very thinking, uh, the very uh, reflection upon organization um, and its link and uh, its link to the spontaneous autonomous uh, self-development of the mass emotion in history. Um, and uh, another another uh, point that I wanted to stress um, in the end of, of, uh, of my intervention was the role uh, that played in this uh, uh, Hegelian, uh, Hegelian breakthrough of, uh, of Dunayevskaya, uh, the, the role played by the second negation, because it is very important also to understand her own uh, interpretation of Marxist humanism. Because uh, this concept was defined by Hegel in the doctrine of being in the logic as uh, distinguished from the first negation, negation as negation in general, uh, because I quote the second negation the negation of a negation, which is concrete, absolute negativity, just as the, the first is on the contrary, only abstract negativity, end of quote. So uh, for her, uh, the need to go beyond the concept of the positive in the negative that uh, was at the time, the overcoming of Stalinism in general, 
implied the need to discover how the second negation can be capable of transcending, transcending contradiction as the deepest and most subjective moment of self-development of spirit, thanks to which I quote, a subject is personal and free. Uh, this uh, character uh, of uh, mm, the second negation, that this uh, op openness to the mm, to the, the, the discover of uh, uh, the subject itself of um, his um, personality is its her personality and freedom is a very very central to, uh, to 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 the discussion to to, to her to her talk and this discussion because the moment and i uh, I, I conclude the moment of uh, uh, the second negation is constituted as a revolution that is also the means through which the revolutionary subject affirms its own personality and freedom in the personal and free character of the revolutionary subject we can um, we can hear that, uh, how reverberate uh, what will be uh, discovered through, uh, through civil rights movement, anti-colonial and feminist movement, that personal is political and that freedom is the horizon of all the liberation movements. So uh, that we cannot subordinate individual and con uh, the concrete on individuals and their freedom on the altar of an abstract development uh, of society, of production for production's sake. So um, I think that this is quite interesting for, for now, today, when, uh, when uh, um, the feminist transnational forms of organization, when uh, ecological, ecological uh, movements, uh, uh, young, um, ecological movements made of uh, by young people black lives matter how um, we should put we should keep uh, the subject and the, the 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 construction of the subject the construction of the political initiative of the political process uh, always trying not to close it in a, a a close ontology, but open to the new the, the novelties that that arrive uh, throughout history. Sorry. I... Thank you so much. Um, and before we ask for the next speaker, I'm going to remind people that we will have a commentator, um, sorry, a co um, person making some comments after Peter, and then we will open the discussion. Um, so if you want to start sending your questions now, or uh, if you want to put yourself, uh, we'll open stack when the discussion starts, but if you want to share your questions now. Also a reminder that this meeting is being recorded. So if you would like um, to send a question uh, without being on the recording, please send it to me in a private or direct message. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Peter Hudes. Sorry, um, Peter Hudes. Um, from uh, Oakton University and also the writer of Franz Fanon, The Philosopher of the Barricades. Well, actually, thank you, Rama, very much. Actually, it's not the university, it's a community college. That makes it, uh, put it in context. <laughs> okay, um, well, a major ongoing debate today in the radical movement uh, is whether or not we should discuss the nature of a socialist uh, society. Uh, most Marxists decline from doing so. They say we don't need to do it either because they think they already know the answer, namely that socialism equals the abolition of private property and free markets, uh, or because they think raising the question distracts from the present struggle. Uh, my two essays in this volume, uh, the first is Donievsky's Concept of Dialectic, which I co-authored with Kevin, and the second, The Indispensability of Philosophy in the Struggle to Develop an Alternative to Capitalism, uh, are a contribution um, to this ongoing debate. Uh, but what does a discussion of Hegel or dialectic, whatever that, whatever we mean by that, what does that have to do with developing a conception of an alternative to capitalism? After all, Hegel was not a socialist, nor did he envision that Marx would later transform his revolution in philosophy into a philosophy of revolution. Uh, so what does Hegel have to do with it? Um, 
Now, I think uh, Jillian Rose, actually, uh, the great Hegel scholar, Jillian Rose, um, spoke to this in 1981 when she wrote the following, and I quote, Hegel's philosophy has no social import if the absolute cannot be thought, end quote. Um, now, I think it can likewise be said that Marx's philosophy has no social import if the new society cannot be thought. And that's because uh, regardless of whether Hegel's absolute is viewed as an actual material reality or whether we view it as uh, a mere idea, the absolute for Hegel is imminent in our daily existence. The absolute is not some heavenly beyond. We implicitly reach for it in each act of cognition. This is Hegel's implicit humanism. As Rose put it, and I quote, if the absolute is misrepresented, we are misrepresenting ourselves. But the absolute has always been mis misrepresented by societies and peoples, for these societies have not been free, and they have represented their lack of freedom to themselves in various religions and political ideology." End quote. Now, decades before Rose wrote this, Donievskaya delved into Hegel's absolutes in, in confronting the crisis of Marxism, a crisis defined by the fact that the abolition of private property and free markets in the USSR and Mao's China and elsewhere led not to a new society, but to state capitalist totalitarianism. And that crisis has not gone away. It has only taken a new form. There is a rebirth of interest in socialism today but both social democrats and more revolutionary tendencies tend to define socialism as the end of private property and free markets. Both clearly have to go, but we need a more adequate notion of the alternative to capitalism, which is not provided by simply limiting the debate to what tactic or strategy can get us to socialism. Here is where I think Vinievskaya's ideas take on new importance beginning, especially in terms of uh, beginning with her work with C.L.R. James and Grace Lee in the Johnson Forest Tendency, which for the rest of my comments, I'm gonna be focusing on here, this work done in from the early 1940s through the mid 1950s. Now the Johnson Forest Tendency issued the first economic analysis of several have mentioned of the Soviet Union and subsequent Stalinist regimes uh, as state capitalists. Hegel figured prominently in their work as well. This was largely due to the influence of Lenin, who came to the shocking uh, conclusion in his 1914 uh, notes on Hegel's science of logic, uh, which Donievsky was the first to translate into English, that as he put it, no Marxist since Marx, including himself, had understood Marx's capital since they hadn't understood Hegel's logic. The impact of Lenin extended even further um, insofar as um, he makes a remarkable statement in his notes that the chapter on the absolute idea uh, in Hegel's Science of Logic is the least idle, idealist and most materialist chapter in the book. In response to JFT for its task as providing a materialist interpretation of Hegel's absolutes for the era of state capitalism defined as they saw it by the absolute contradiction of counter-revolution emerging from within revolution. The JFT's explorations of Hegel, therefore, from 1941 to 1955, can be considered the first instantiation of Hegelian Marxism in America, a fact that is very general, uh, very rarely noticed and often overlooked. Now, I want to focus just on three aspects of their reading of Hegel that distinguished them from other Marxists then and now. First, from Engels to today, many leftists have applauded Hegel's dialectical method as critical and revolutionary while condemning the culmination of this philosophical system in a series of absolutes as mystical and idealist. Dunievsky rejected the separation of method and system because it reduces dialectic to a tool or instrument. Hegel makes it perfectly clear that the dialectical cognition is not a formal method that is applied to an external content or an object. On the contrary, it's a mode of thinking that makes it possible to grasp the being of the object, what it is in and of itself. Dialectics is a method at one with the content of its subject matter. To be a dialectician means therefore opening ourselves up to a way of thinking that breaks from the formalist and intuitionist ways of thinking that define our ordinary natural consciousness. Now this couldn't be further away, of course, from how 
many people throw around the word dialectics as if it's like a synonym for paradox. Oh, it, was, uh, it, 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 it can be this, but it can also be that. It's dialectical, you've all heard that kind of talk, or uh, as a synonym for process. It was this, it became that, therefore it's dialectical. Uh, this, this has nothing to do with what Hegel means by dialectic, and you don't need Hegel to utter such finalities. Uh, rather, the dialectic is a mode of thinking that makes palpable the imminence of the absolute, which in Hegelian terms means the overcoming of the alienation. Second, many have claimed that Hegel's system culminates in a series of absolutes in which a particularity, otherness, and difference are swallowed up by abstract thought. Post-colonial theorists have used this to accuse Hegel of an imperialist mindset that dismisses anything not reducible to the abstractions of Western rationalism. Now, James Lee and Dunievsky, two of them people of color, one of them a Jew, right, were fully aware of Hegel's uninformed comments on Africa and non-Western peoples, but they did not reject Hegel's philosophy because of it. And that wasn't because they downplayed racism. On the contrary, they did pivotal work in opposing, in the same period, the class reductionism that defined Western Marxism by arguing for the independent validity of the freedom struggles of African Americans. The all too fashionable rejections of Hegel that dominate today's academic uh, left forgets that a work of philosophy like a work of art is only great insofar as it escapes its author. Hegel lives on precisely because our efforts to overcome alienation have so far not, not borne fruit. Those who reject Hegel deny themselves access to the mode of thought that can enable us to grapple with and potentially surmount that contradiction. Third, Hegel has been accused of glorifying the Prussian state, although recent Hegel scholarship rejects and undermines this claim. Now, it's true that the absolute in Hegel involves mutual recognition between individuals and the state, but Hegel means by the state, not an impressive hierarchy, but institution in which the freedom of each is assured through the freedom of all. An idea of freedom, that is, that lacks concrete material embodiment in actual institutions, is formalist and empty. Absolute knowing is the knowledge that we, and not some outside force, are the authors of our norms and practices insofar as existing social relations realize or come to realize that very principle. In this sense, Hegel's absolute serves as the measure of the extent to which social formations embody freedom in a positive sense, not just in a negative sense, freedom from, but in a positive sense. But there's a big problem in Hegel, big limitation in Hegel. He does not tell us how such a social transformation can be achieved. As he wrote in the philosophy of religion, and I quote, how, can the, actual, how the actual present day world is to find its way out of the state of dualism between individual interests and collective practice and what form it is to take are questions which must be left to itself to settle and to deal with them is not the immediate and practical business of philosophy, end quote. Now, here I think is, a, is the divide between Marx and Hegel. As Martin Hagelung has re recently put it, I'm quoting him, for Marx, absolute knowing cannot be limited to the theoretical achievement of the philosopher. Rather, absolute knowing must be a practical achievement that in principle can be taken up and sustained by everyone, end quote. This, as far as I can see, is the meaning of Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, which Kieran mentioned. Not that we forego the effort to think the absolute, let alone the need to think philosophically, but that we change the world by creating social conditions that makes it possible for the absolute to be known, which is the precondition for knowing ourselves since the absolute is imminent in us. This is the fundamental meaning of humanism, at least for Marx and Marxist humanism. So how might the JFT's work on Hegel from long ago speak uh, to uh, today's effort uh, to develop a viable conception of the alternative to the capitalist mode of production? Now, to get to that, I should, I should mention that the JFT engaged in an at times rather over hasty tendency to map Hegelian concepts directly onto contemporary politics. But this is understandable. 
Uh, you got to remember that none of the leaders of the JFT and very few of its members, none of the leaders of the JFT and very few of its members were academics. And Dunyevskaya never even attended college. She learned her Hegel the same way she learned Marx, as a militant in a revolutionary organization. And in fact, I think there's no better way to learn dialectics, precisely because dialectics is about the transformation of reality. It has to, even if it's in a classroom, it has to be involved in some activity, some process of freedom struggle for it to be comprehensible. Now, I think this is evident in what is probably the best known product of the JFT's Hegel studies. C.L.R. James's 1948 work, Notes on Dialectics, but was only published many decades later. James's work in this period contains some real gems, such as the following, I'm gonna quote James. He states, the real history of humanity is being worked out in Hegel's doctrine of the notion. When the masses, not a few philosophers, grasp the dialectic, the logic, the unity of theoretical, practical, methodological, we have reached the absolute idea of society, that is social humanity. There begins the development of human power for its own sake, end quote. That's James. Now he goes on to devote much of this book, Notes on Dialectics, to applying Hegel's absolute idea to the search for an alternative uh, to the Leninist vanguard party form of organization, which Alessandra has just discussed. Uh, and the JFT was trying to break from that concept at the time. He calls for a party of a totally new type that does not represent the workers, but constitutes the workers as a class, a party as he puts it, which consists of all the workers, that is what the Soviets of 1905 and 1917 represented, end quote. With this new kind of party, larger and broader than even uh, the most massive trade union, the difference between the being and knowing as separate functions of the working class would, fun would vanish. Such an organization, he says, that ends the division between leaders and ranks would be the instantiation of Hegel's absolute. As he put it, and I quote James, now, if the party is the knowing of the proletariat, then the coming of the age of the proletariat means the abolition of the party. This is our new universal, stated in its boldest and most abstract form. This is our universal, the question of the party." End quote. But, you know, this raises a kind of problem. If the, form of, if the new form of organization, the mass party, that is not for the workers, but is of the workers, is the absolute made manifest, what is the role of theoreticians? Are they needed to address the ultimate goal of socialist society? Are they needed at all? It logically follows from James's position that there is no need for theoreticians to discuss a post-capitalist future. And that's exactly what he argued explicitly shortly after the breakup of the Johnson Forest tenancy in 1955, in his 1958 work, Facing reality, where in discussing the mass struggles that had broken out during and following the Hungarian Revolution and including the civil rights movement in the United States, James wrote the following, and I quote, it is agreed, James writes, that the socialist society exists. We only have to record the fact of its existence. These workers have struck a blow against common injustice, racial discrimination, and the disorder in production which management creates. That is the social society. It does not have to be organized in the future. It exists now, end quote. Well, um, James's unmediated identification of Hegel's absolute with the dialectic of the party essentially led him to deny the indispensability of philosophy and with it, the need to address what happens after the revolution before it occurs. Now, Dunyevskaya was initially much taken with James's notes, uh, but as she engaged in her own Hegel studies from 1948 through the mid 1950s, she became increasingly dissatisfied with his direction. In a letter to James and Lee of May 1953, she writes that she is now exploring Hegel's absolute idea in terms of, as she puts it, the differentiation of us from Lenin, but, but not only from Lenin, but even from 1948 a clear critical reference to James's notes and dialectics. She then states that the section on the absolute law of capitalist accumulation in Marx's capital is based on Hegel's absolute idea insofar as the former consists of the absolute contradiction between the accumulation of capital at one pole 
and the revolt of the workers at the other. However, she points out that the Hegelian system does not end with the absolute ideal. The conclusion of Hegel's logic intimates a new sphere that follows it, the philosophy of spirit, which is the culminating and final work of his philosophical system. Unfortunately, and for reasons I don't quite understand, the least read of Hegel's major works. It takes up the contradictory, this philosophy of spirit takes up the contradictory efforts of institutions like the family, civil society, and the state to embody the ideal of freedom. In sum, the philosophy of spirit, not to be confused with the phenomenology of spirit, the philosophy of spirit, discusses the transcendence of alienation, not just as a logical principle, as in the science of logic, but in terms of concrete forms of social life in which the freedom of each depends upon the freedom of all. Hence, whereas James read Hegel in order to illustrate the need for a new kind of party, Dunievskaya read Hegel more broadly in terms of how his absolutes intimate in abstract form, a new kind of society that transcends alienation. This reading of Hegel's absolutes as the new society proves central to her to subsequent development after she and James departed uh, of Marxist humanism from the late 50s through the 1980s. And you can see the fullest treatment of that uh, in her 1973 work, which we haven't said much about so far, Philosophy and Revolution, which begins with a chapter entitled, Why Hegel, Why Now? But the point here is that the logical determination of her exploration of Hegel is that the role of a Marxist organization is not restricted to giving free voice to spontaneous struggle. And in fact, you really don't need a Marxist organization to do that. It's most of all needed to clarify the meaning of socialism as a philosophical project. Now, the logical determination of James's notes and dialectics, where does that go logically? It's revealed by his response to the birth of Solidarność in Poland in 1980s, massive workers' movement that emerged called Solidarity. Seemingly out of nowhere, in less than a few months, the Polish working class created a new form of organization, 10 million strong. You cannot ask for a more magnificent demonstration of spontaneous mass creativity. It would seem that by claiming the allegiance of almost the entire Polish working class, Solidarność was the incarnation of the new kind of party that James had envisioned in Notes and Dialectics. And guess what, folks? That's exactly what he said in his speech in London in 1980. He said, look at Poland Solidarność. That's what I was talking about in 1948, Notes and Dialectics. However, while the form of organization was in accord with James's vision, it pretty soon turned out that the, its political content was not. Solidarność arose at a historical moment defined by the discrediting of status socialism around the world and the absence of any alternative concept of socialism that masses of people could rally around. But you know, there's an old saying, uh, uh, nature doesn't like a void. You know, history doesn't like a void either. And the void in articulating a viable alternative to capitalism led Solidarność within a number of years by the late 80s to capitulate once it took power to, ne to neoliberalism. Not long after, it was evicted from power by the far more reactionary forces of right-wing populism. And ever since, political retrogression, including outright neo-fascism, has rushed in where leftists have feared to tread. That is, taking the trouble to think out at least an outline the specific kind of social relation needed for a truly free society. In sum, <clears throat> the dialectic, <clears throat> in sum, the dialectic of the party proved to be a dead end. James's approach has been followed by much of the anti-Leninist and anti-Vanguardist left, which has resulted in an abdication of responsibility for providing spontaneous revolts with a vision of the future. Taking a wrong turn in history is my conclusion here, Taking a, wrong turn, it, taking a wrong turn in theory uh, takes its toll. And so it is today, dominated by discourses that not only disparage thinking the future, but even thinking the human, as if that too needs to be tossed out as an estranged insight of Western thought. The claim that the human can no longer be thought, which dominates, of course, postmodernism, post-structuralism, or post-colonial theory, and a good deal uh, philosophical reflections on race theory uh, is an estranged, ins uh, 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 such a notion that the, the human can no longer be thought, uh, can only misrepresent ourselves as well as freedom itself. But the absolute, whether understood in Hegelian terms as a, as a transcendence of alienation 
or in Marxist humanist terms, as a truly socialist society can be thought, if only we're daring enough to think it. Thank you, Peter. Um, and now we will have um, the next speaker who will um, give some comments before we open up discussions. And this will be Savji Dogen, author of Marx and Hegel on the individual and the social. Savji. Thank you. I also thank, thank you so much for organizing uh, this mini conference. I don't know if it is uh, irony, but <laughs> I think it is a great uh, major conference. Um, it is really uh, inspiring and uh, stimulating for me. Um, I, I thank all, to all, uh, all speakers for sharing these in interesting and also exciting, uh, exciting ideas with us. Um, here uh, we are talking the unification of uh, practice and uh, theory speakers in some way following and um, contributing the previous uh, session. So I uh, would you like to begin with um, some uh, simple uh, but at the same time uh, difficult questions and uh, the speakers already in some way uh, referred these questions. So the answer to these uh, questions were uh, given uh, by Marx um, in his own writings from uh, manuscripts uh, to, to the capital and uh, by Hegel in Science of Logic and, and by other post-Marxist post -Marx -Marxist like uh, Dunayevskaya, Marcuse, Lenin, uh, Luxembourg uh, and others. So the first question is, um, as um, Alessandra also refers to, uh, what the essence uh, is, uh, the essence of something. Uh, so Hegel in Science of Logic says that essence uh, must appear by referring to a, a dialectical relationship between uh, essence and uh, appearance. So I think the question of essence is uh, in the center of uh, Marx and uh, Marxism, uh, we can confirm Hegel's statement with the, with the Turkish and uh, Canadian cases in these days. Uh, the first case is referring to today's uh, developments and the latter refers to the past. Uh, in Turkey, um, uh, in these days, uh, for example, the essence of the state comes to light through uh, through um, uh, confessions uh, of a criminal in Canada, the essence of civilization um, and colonization along with the truth of the history uh, becomes uh, evident. So we witness again uh, the barbarity of humanity, for instance, in, uh, in Canada, which is considered as a uh, civilized uh, country in the world in contrary to those countries considered uncivilized like uh, African ones, where the essence of colonization is uh, questioned, uh, the essence of civilization and the root of history is needed to be uh, questioned again. So the question, what is the essence of history? What is the truth of history? What is the essence of humanity, the essence of human being, the essence of state, nation, civilization, capitalism, state capitalism? Um, uh, etc. So these are the questions that uh, we have to uh, ask as um, uh, Hegelian Marxists, um, of course, by avoiding the uh, essentialist approach, but more philosophical and di dialectical way. Uh, the second uh, question is, uh, as Peter Hudis already refers to, why is uh, dialectics so important for, for Marxism? Why was uh, it's so important for Marx and post-Marx Marxists such as Lukács, uh, Duyanevskaya, Marcuse, and other members of Frankfurt School like Adorno, who alternatively suggest a new concept, um, uh, concept of dialectics, and uh, we can add also Gramsci and others. So um, there will be different answers to these questions. Um, maybe one of them is uh, is that at the end of the the 19th century at the, at the beginning of the 20th century, there is a shift from the materialist element to idealist one in, in Marxism, which doesn't mean to uh, abandon or re-announcement of materialist approach, but 
means to become aware of in con con uh, con incompleteness or deficiency of uh, this materialist uh, perspective. So it means that still there is uh, a need to think about philosophy and theory or um, revolutionary movement. Um, this can be related to Marx uh, 11 thesis in which Marx in my view uh, refers to the time or the moment of realization of uh, theory in praxis without uh, abandoning or stopping following theory. Um, I think Dujanevskaya uh, uh, in this point teaches us uh, three important things about uh, dialectics um, which uh, she she found in Hegel and uh, and Marx and which she uh, applied to the historical events and moments um, during the period period in which she lived. Um, uh, maybe there are more than three uh, we can find in in this volume in these articles uh, on relation of Hegel to uh, Dujanevskaya, but I will mention uh, three of them which are still relevant to uh, to our times. So the first one, uh, the speakers all also referred to the dialectic of self-development uh, through a double negation or uh, negativity, uh, and the second uh, emphasize on the movement in permanent uh, and constant, and the last one, the contradiction. Uh, for example, this uh, contradiction is um, obvious today because of COVID-19, which reveals self-contradiction of liberal democracy and neoliberal policies, uh, the increase of authoritarian regimes, which therefore disclose uh, uh, the contradiction of uh, democracy and the contradiction that we can find in, in the essence of the states. Uh, through this contradiction, there is self-movement of masses, um, movements and uh, spontaneous and self-movement uh, of masses in different parts of the world. Here, uh, we can observe the importance of dialectics to comprehend um, the contemporary uh, society. Uh, I think for Hegel, uh, identity is the way to overcome uh, these contradictions. Mm, maybe here we can ask a question about uh, this identity, whether this it was the same for uh, Dujanarskaya and, and Marx. Um, Another important thing of these dialectics uh, is uh, Dujanevskaya's understanding of absolute different from Hegel, uh, which refers to new beginning and which leaves the door um, open to transformation, change, and um, a new understanding of Marxism based on uh, humanist idea. Um, human as subject at the center of, of theory, but does not mean the ignorance uh, or uh, abolishment of subject. Uh, uh, I'm referring it because Adorno uh, very much criticized uh, Hegel and Marx um, uh, about the, the, the relationship or dialectical relationship between uh, subject and object. And uh, according to uh, Adorno, subject is uh, 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 subject. Uh, the, the importance that we can find in Marx and Hegel is subject more than object. Uh, so um, for this reason, this book, uh, I guess, talks about uh, intersexuality, which is a result of dialectics and uh, emphasize uh, Marxian concept of relation. Um, it, uh, it doesn't only talk about the intersexuality of gender, race, and class, but um, the philosophical thinking or thought intersects like the Hegelian and Marxian elements uh, that we can find in the articles of these speakers in, in this session, in this volume. Um, I think uh, here there is an important thing to underline uh, or an um, important difference between Marx and uh, Dujanevskaya that while Marx, um, I think, never tries to save or rescue Hegel's um, dialectics from being uh, criticized for his, uh, for his absolute as a conclusion, uh, uh, Dujanevskaya dedicates herself to uh, uh, highlight how Hegel is uh, crucial for humanist Marxism along with 
um, Marx uh, humanism. Uh, so here um, my question and uh, maybe Peter Hood is already uh, um, answered the question, but why is the concept of absolute uh, so crucial or important for, for Marxism? Why is it um, uh, not absolute, but absolute, why it's pu pu plural? Uh, so this, uh, this means uh, uh, different beginnings or different uh, self, um, self movements. Uh, uh, this absolute uh, refers to uh, what? Uh, so Dionyskaya uh, search for um, a Marxism, which, uh, as Karen Birkin points out in in his uh, article, is both uh, theory of liberation and uh, practice of uh, liberation. So I think this um, this summarizes Dionyskaya's uh, Hegelian uh, Marxist humanism. Uh, I'm concluding here. Thank you so much. Now, I wanted to ask the panelists if uh, they wanted to respond to Sevji now and then open the discussion, or should we go ahead and take some questions? I think it might be better just to go into discussion and then we'll respond to Sevji and anybody else. Okay. Does that sound okay? Yes. Alessandra, Kira? Yeah, sorry, I, I agree with Peter. Sorry, yeah, good idea. We have one question in the comments. Um, maybe we can uh, state that first and then take stack. Um, could the speakers elaborate on Jane's statement in Notes of Dialectics that Lenin's reading of Hegel as a theorist of leaps and breaks influenced the slogan, turn the imperialist war into a civil war? And Chris, please feel free to um, add to that if you have anything else to say. Um, we have David on step. David, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I was struck uh, listening to uh, Peter Hudis's contribution, how um, uh, when James said that you know uh, we're already in 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 the new society and that you know there's nothing left to organize that you know the workers are go to build uh, socialism um uh, without the capitalists without the bureaucracy it's it's um certain to happen um it strikes me that uh, certain ideas that they have an objectivity where they live on a long a long time after they were born and they take various forms and it, it strikes me that um in a way one of the inheritors of um C. Lord James and his uh, theory of spontaneity is the modern phenomena of the communizers um, who seem to be allied with um, Heideggerian uh, theology in the form of uh, uh, Giorgio Agamben and um, also seem to take similar ideas from uh, Jacques Kermat, who uh, took his ideas from Amadeus Bordiga, the founder of the Italian Communist Party, who uh, renounced organization or building around the same time, it struck me this, this into the talk, around the same time as uh, uh, the Johnson Forest tendency said there's nothing left to organize. So if you think of, say, a young person who's aware of the environmental crisis, as I think everyone is, apart from uh, 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 the fanatical religious right, um, 
uh, someone who wants to get involved in, you know, um, saving the world, um, do they get involved in green capitalism? Do they get involved with the state? Uh, do they get involved with left politics, with activist politics? Or is there um, another way to do it? And and the attitude of the communizers and Takun and um, Agamben at all seems to be that underneath the topsoil of uh, politics and class struggle can be found this pure communism, which can be lived immediately through um, new kinds of relationships, new relationships with nature, um, in interpersonal relationships, um, abolition of gender. And it says in the manifesto, they don't need uh, uh, theoreticians. What they need is poets and, and uh, theologians. <laughs> well, I, th I think the poets can pretty much look after themselves. Uh, as we goes for the theologians, well, Agamben, he, he denies being a theologian. He, he uh, says he's a, he's, a, he's a philosopher. So uh, my only point is to say that I think there are a lot of philosophical battles of ideas to be fought. Thank you, David. Next uh, on stack is Andre Simon. He's got five. I, I, I don't know if I have a specific question or a remark to one of the speakers, except a, a little line of thought that came up in the, in the, um, the presentations, which is, I, I'd like to say something sacrilegious. Um, I, I've often thought that the national the struggles of national minorities or of targeted oppressed groups were sideline struggles <laughs> because um, it's often been what presented um, the best that we've been able to be guided towards is attaining the stature I'm sorry of, to yes. Cut out for a few seconds there. So could you please perhaps restate your question? Turn off my video. Uh, what I was going to say is that uh, I'd like to say something which is probably sacrilegious, which is over the years I've I've, I've almost come to the conclusion that um, struggles for the rights of national minorities in this country are sideline issues. That. Um, what we've been sold is the idea that we want to be equal to whites, which already to me is impo an impoverished stature, an impo impoverished status. Uh, uh, I'm not really sure uh, how to express this, but um, <laughs> I, I know that uh, the experience of the Soviet Union and, and China has shown us that seizing uh, the means of production and abolishing private property and setting up a strong state are not enough to really be socialism. But if we, if we don't have that, if we don't have that, I think that would be the prerequisite for any other really meaningful um, changes that would uh, uh, elevate people. Um, so I, I guess those were sort of my responses that, um, yes, I, I, I know that what we're, we're shooting for is um, uh, a liberation of human possibilities, of human potentialities in a way that probably has not yet been seen anywhere on the planet, despite all of the 20th century revolutions or 21st century attempts at revolution. But, but by the same token, I, I, I don't know if, if, if unless um, all of the uh, machinery of a uh, of production of, of being able to uh, reproduce our our day to day our everyday living conditions isn't placed firmly in the hands of the vast majority of producers. All of these other all of these other um, possibilities are are moot. 
Uh, I guess that's all. I was just a, a reaction to some of the comments. Thank you. I know you're muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, next process, please go ahead, Chris. Hey. Um, so I, I think it's really interesting in this conversation, um, you know, because it's often kind of asked, like, like, what's the point of philosophy, um, especially um, and the response is kind of like, well, you know, you you do it anyway. You like when you're doing the activism, you're practicing some kind of philosophy. The philosophy is being generated um, through the creativity of struggle um, and the human creativity involved in that. And um, I, I think that's a really important perspective on like what philosophy is. And I was kind of wondering if people maybe could give some thoughts of what they think examples are of philosophy generated out of activity, or maybe examples of philosophy being practiced that most people just wouldn't recognize as philosophy because um, they're maybe more used to um, thinking of philosophy in this kind of like enlightenment prescriptive kind of way, where you kind of generate a morality and then that informs all your actions and this is how it's practiced. Oh, you're muted again. I'm so sorry. Thanks for having me. Let me come back here. I apologize. Um, thank you, Chris. And we have next is. I apologize. My computer is. Yeah. Can you please see if anybody else is? That stack. Uh, Kevin, in stack. Yeah, I put myself on stack, but it went only to Chris. I made a mistake. Yeah, I just have a really quick question. I mean, quick to ask, but not necessarily to answer. Directed to Kieran. Uh, you know, a, a lot of our a lot of our friends on the left want to attack liberalism all the time, and. Uh, they, they, they sometimes see us being, since we're humanists or we're, or we're liberals ultimately, and especially the stance a lot of us took on fascism this morning, it bothers certain parts of the far left. So uh, one thing that always comes up is, well, you're humanist. Isn't that a liberal concept? So if, Kieran, can you just differentiate a little more Marxist or socialist humanism from previous forms of humanism. I mean, not, I mean, commonalities, obviously, also. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we can go to uh, the panelists now, if you would like to uh, respond to these questions. And I think I'll follow the example of Chris and go down the list, if that's okay. okay. Um, so, Kieran, did you have, um, would you like to go ahead and respond? Hi, Rana. Hi, everyone. Um, so, I realized earlier my bandwidth might have been poor, so I'm not sure if you heard much of my talk or you can hear me now. Yep. Okay. Um, so, I may go in and out. I live in the countryside here and we get terrible signals. So, I think I'll, I'll leave um, most of the detailed discussion of um, Hegel and Hegelian dialectics to, to uh, Peter and Alessandra. But um, I guess I, I wanted to start, if, if possible, with um, what Dave said about this, the necessity for the, the battle in terms of theory. So, in my, in my talk, I, I spent a bit of time kind of denigrating the professional Marxists to make this this absolute separation between themselves, the theorists on the one hand and the workers 
um, on on the other hand. Um, but there is a role for theory. Kevin mentioned this, Dwayne Oscar mentions it, and the role is actually very significant. And although, as Chris said, um, and others have pointed out, philosophy, and I try to point out in my talk as well, that theory comes from a common experience, the experience of contradiction and, and unfulfilled wholeness and universality in life. It comes from daily existence. And in that sense, I think Diana Sky is absolutely right when she points out that there's nothing in the thought of the theorist that is not in the activity of, of the workers. And, and, and you see, in answer to, to Chris's question, Marx exemplifying that you know, philosophy and action is someone who, and Diana Sky also, who is deeply involved in, in the working class movement of the time. But he also does something different to that, doesn't he? He's, a, he's a, someone schooled in philosophy that spends time in luxury, had a luxury, a relative luxury, because he wasn't, wasn't living exactly in the life of luxury, but he maintained or tried to maintain a bourgeois existence in London at the time, whilst being afforded the time to think and study. So something, something different does happen. Something, I think, really important happens in, in, in theory. That it doesn't mean it can only be done by an academic, but there's something about standing back from that existence and reflecting upon it and seeing the deeper connections uh, that is, is manifestly important. And we shouldn't give over to an inverted snobbery towards theorists as well. Um, certain theorists, of course, and, and um, Dave made the, uh, the very salient point, I think, of the, the, the influence of Heideggerian forms of, forms of thought on, on the left uh, today and for some time now, for the last I guess, uh, 50 or 60 or more years. Um, and Nietzschean, thought, Nietzschean forms of thought also, um, which you can see in Agamben, and you can see in a whole raft of other, other thinkers. Um, and the elitism that goes with, 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 with Heidegger's thinking, also the connections with fascism that, that are insufficiently pulled out in relation to these thinkers who are all too often, I think, uncritically valorized. Um, um, in this kind of dialectic or this kind of attempt to kind of um, resolve the tension between humanism and anti-humanism that develops in the in the middle of the 20th century. And perhaps I could, could say something in relation to Kevin's question here about the, the concept of humanism, which I think is terribly, terribly understood in academia, terribly understood in most places uh, in the left. And I very much chime with Lewis's um, Lewis Gordon's comments in, in the first panel when he, when he expressed how welcome it felt to be in a, a, a kind of a meeting space where the majority of people at least were, were open to, to humanism as a, as a critical form of practice as well as, as, well as theory. So I think um, Kevin made this, uh, suggested the distinction um, that is absolutely central to understanding and Dionovskaya and critical and dialectical forms of humanism today between a liberal form of humanism and a Marxist form of humanism. And of course, if you follow Marx's writings himself, he initially announces that, uh, and follows the kind of the, 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 the movement of the young Hegelians at the time in speaking of humanism. He then comes to critique that humanism in, in, in writing subsequent to uh, the economic and philosophic manuscripts, but what he does when he critiques the humanism of, I guess, the young Hegelians is he critiques the abstractness of that humanism and its, its abstraction from political questions, from real life as lived. So I think, and he goes on to say, to make these criti criticisms um, that are very pointed, but often misinterpreted, I think, as wholesale criticisms, criticisms of humanism. Whether Marx himself critiqued humanism or not, it doesn't obviate the fact that humanism, as with other words, under chain, uh, undergo modulations in meaning. They, they, they are mutable terms that manifestly change. So up, in, up into the 20th century and, and the time of the anti-colonial revolutions, the anti-Stalinist revolutions, Dionovskaya, uh, from a whole series of other, Fanon, a whole series of other thinkers adopt this this um, notion of uh, this term humanism, it's changed its meaning, at least it's changed its meaning from its initial um, appearance in the, the, you know, the, the German uh, 18th century school curriculum where they talk about classical learning and it's changed its meaning from um, the, 
the, the meaning it may have had with, with the young Hegelians at the time, it becomes something very specific that is an answer to changes in the world that have taken place that were taking place at the time. Um, and the the wholesale denunciation of humanism that you find in certain uh, anti-humanist kind of schools, the structuralist, post-structuralist, the post-colonial thinkers forgets this, I think. And it, there, are, there are a whole series of ironies here, as well as in the colonial um, connection, uh, considering the fact that the, the anti-colonial figures and thinkers and revolutionaries appropriate the term humanism at the same time, or I should reverse this, the, the anti-humanist thinkers move away from the term humanism at the same time as the colonial anti-colonial thinkers are appropriating it. A kind of deep, deep irony that I think isn't reflected upon, upon sub, uh, sufficiently um, today. But yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave that there and maybe come back to some of this later. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, now it's um, Alessa, Alessandra. So. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Well, I don't know. I probably uh, not able to answer all the all the things that uh, were put in the plate that were like uh, a lot. <laughs> and uh, what I can um, my 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 opinion uh, it is uh, quite important uh, to and probably it is. Uh, somehow distributed in different uh, questions that were put, like the question of uh, uh, human and, uh, and uh, which, uh, and the, the absolute and which role of the specific, uh, um, the specific interpretation of a human, or what is the for Dunayeska humanism is, uh, uh, is relevant. Um, is uh, that uh, she's not, and we are not, <laughs> I suppose, in search of, uh, uh, an abstract essence or of something um, anom uh, something that can be homogeneous uh, instead the, 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 the opposite the, the, the very concept of, uh, of the human that uh, Dunayevskaya uh, proposed and uh, develops uh, uh, throughout her life is uh, uh, rooted in the uh, Marxian uh, uh, definition of uh, human as a, an historical, uh, an, an historical, um, uh, and uh, I don't know the, the, the word in English, but uh, the, an, um, an historical concept. So something that, uh, in, the, in the specific uh, idea of history that he has. So something uh, and uh, it reminds to me what uh, Sergi, if I don't uh, mispronounce uh, her name, was uh, was saying about what is the truth of history. We can we are uh, seeing uh, like uh, what is happening in Turkey, what is happening in Canada. What is the truth of history? Probably uh, the, the 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 only truth we can say about history it is, is it is that it is an open. Open, an open process that is something that uh, in which uh, many uh, forces uh, are uh, involved and many forces play a role and everyone sorry uh, and everyone uh, and every of this force uh, sorry okay and every of this force um, is uh, uh, is uh, like in this in this field uh, is on the field, but uh, uh, the way we see, and the way I see, and the, the, the idea that I have from Dunayevska of uh, what human is, is uh, something that uh, um, always uh, uh, reproduce, uh, reproduce, and uh, um, the, 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 it's uh, it is the, what I, I don't know how to say in English, but uh, the idea is that. Uh, is something which is uh, capable of articulating, of uh, subverting the very um, presum presumption of its, its, own in, in its own existence. So uh, we can see that this, this concept is uh, um, very powerful, for example, for feminists, uh, for in, in feminism, like uh, what is uh, from uh, De Beauvoir to uh, to uh, uh, 
to the, 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 the 70s uh, reflection. So like what we think it is the woman, it is always a, 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 a rebel, like a, something that, uh, um, that cannot be, uh, cannot be um, uh, predeterminated at all. And that is why the, the dialectic plays a fundamental role in this process, because in the dialectics and in the reading of, of uh, the Donetsk gives of the Hegelian dialectics, the subject and the object are, um, influence, uh, are influencing each other, but at the same time, uh, the, 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 the the, there are this, the, the subjective condition of, of the object and the objective condition of the of the subject. So these two elements are not just uh, um, not just always in transformation of it, uh, well, from one another, but also their relationship is not given. Is not something given once for all. It is in in the very process of of, of transformation. So. What I can say about the, uh, for example, the, the, um, and the, how this relates to the, the concept of intersectionality that was uh, uh, raised in this question before, like uh, it is exactly uh, what we say, for example, in Turkey, what is uh, going on in Turkey, uh, where uh, first women were, like first uh, Kurdish people were, um, uh, attacked by, uh, by, by the state uh, and showed the, 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 the um, authoritarian character of the, of the state. And then women were attacked, uh, attacked at the same time. And then LGBT, uh, QI plus, uh, people are being attacked. And the, and the attack on the Istanbul convention is, uh, uh, a, a, a further step because it connected the, the Turkey uh, with uh, Turkey, with uh, Poland, with uh, Hungary, and with other uh, countries that are that are uh, um, um, in which the, the, the patriarchal attack uh, uh, backlash is uh, uh, is growing. But at the same time, we cannot see just this because we cannot erase we cannot erase the, the, the fundamental role that women and LGBTQ people and Kurdish people and all these uh, fights, all these struggles that are, are going on are uh, modifying continuously the, um, the attack and, and the repression the, uh, that is played on them. Thank you, Alessandro. Peter? Uh, yeah, thank you all for those. <clears throat> questions and comments, and especially uh, Asemji for a very provocative uh, response. Um, Asemji asked a really, made a really great point. She said, well, why is it that Marx who never really says anything positive about Hegel's absolutes? I mean, when he gets to the absolute in Hegel, he says a lot of critical things about it because he thinks uh, it's an idealistic mystification, he calls it at one point, the, the money of the spirit, yes? Why is Dunievskaya, who, you know, thought very highly of Marx, to put it mildly. Uh, why did she focus on exactly this part of Hegel that Marx tended to neglect or seems to neglect? And that virtually every Marxist, uh, with some few exceptions, neglected. Um, well, I mean, uh, one answer is the objective world we're living in. Um, everybody before the, before the emergence of Stalinism, that is the transformation of a successful Revolution. Dunyevskaya was a supporter of the Bolshevik Revolution. She was a supporter of the Bolshevik seizure of power, and she said, called herself a Bolshevik to the end of her life. If anybody doesn't believe that, believe me, I can tell you a lot of documentation to tell you. Although she was very critical of a lot of the things the Bolsheviks did, but she certainly supported that revolution, and she was very, very, you know, highly admiring of Lenin for many, many things, even when she was very highly critical of him. But all of the revolutionaries prior to the transformation of a successful revolution in Russia in 1917 into its opposite, a Stalinist dictatorship, all assumed from Marx onward, including Marx, that revolution was enough, was sufficient to bring forth a new society. And that's why they worked on that, right? They didn't have to speculate. They didn't feel they needed to speculate much about a post-capitalist future. That was utopianism, let alone worry about obscure aspects of Hegel's text like the absolute it was pretty simple, it was very clear-sighted what had to be done. You make a revolution, you abolish the uh, property right of the bourgeoisie, you nationalize that property, you put it under control under some form of workers' uh, self-determination, 
And there you've got the transition to socialism. What, what happened though? I mean, you gotta learn from history. You gotta learn from what happen happens in your history. And we had a lot of revolutions after 1917. Chinese revolution was a pretty damn important revolution, right? Uh, and we can talk about other revolutions and revolutionary regimes in the developing world, in Africa, in Latin America, et cetera, et cetera, that followed that. Every one of them, in every single case, the revolution did not lead to a new society. It led to dictatorship. Even when the property right of the bourgeoisie was either severely limited or eliminated, uh, and even when it was claimed that, well, the masses have control of the means of production, but of course the party in the name of the party, the party has control in the name of the masses. So it wasn't really, a, it was nominal, not real, not really effective. So what was missing? Now, today, it may seem like this is all ancient history. And one of the problems that we have with the, with the wonderful rebirth and renaissance of socialism, new generation of people coming into the socialist movement as never before, that I haven't seen in decades, uh, is that it seems to be ancient history. But then you look around and you realize, wait a second, why are we still talking about socialism as if it is the same way it would have been defined 100 years ago? There's a, there's a, as, as was discussed in the morning session, the second international is undergoing a renaissance of interest. The Kautsky, there's a Kautsky revival, right? Uh, we can, there's a Maoist revival. All of them based on the assumption that socialism equals nationalized property and the abolition of the market. I mean, has nothing been learned from history? So what's going on, right? Um, well, there's not much of a history of discussing the content of a socialist society that goes beyond that. And that's what we as an organization, the International Marxist Humanist Organization, see as one of our main purposes to invigorate that discussion on that topic and to bring that issue into debate. Well, this is what Dunievskaya turned to Hegel as part of her effort to initiate and to enter that debate in her period. Because she was living at a time, coming of age, as it were, what she was really born theoretically with the Hitler-Stalin Pact of 1939, when the Soviet Union, the worker state, joins with fascism, there never would have been a Holocaust if not for Stalin, right? That's very clear. Hitler, Hitler came to power because of Stalin and he was able to launch World War II because of Stalin. So when you have that and leftists still supporting Stalin, something is rotten in the state of Denmark as, you, as Shakespeare would put it. So she saw revolution is not sufficient to bring forth a new society. That's why she said, wait a second, this negation of the negation in Hegel, you can't just negate the existing society. You've also got to negate your, your negation to go beyond the limitations of your negation. And then she finds the 1844 manuscripts where she finds, gee, Marx pulls this very concept of negation of negation out of Hegel and he applies it in 1844 when he's 26 years old to a critique of his fellow communists. He says they just focus on the first negation, getting rid of the property right of the bourgeoisie. They don't focus on the need for a negation of the negation to get to what he calls true humanism. And she looks at that in the early 1940s and said, how come nobody's ever talked about this? Now, when she does talk about it, other Marxists say, oh, wow, that's interesting. Marx read Hegel. There's more, there's more Hegel in Marx than we thought. But, you know, Marx doesn't really talk about the absolute, so we don't need that. Why are you talking about the absolute, Raya? Well, you know, she, she was an amazing thing about Raya. This is what C.L.I. James said about Raya. Long after they broke up, they broke up their, their political relationship, it was a letter that he wrote years later. He says, the amazing thing about Dunievskaya was that she was such a fast learner. This is a woman who learned the ins and outs of all three volumes of capital. I know not how. She had no university education. She learned it within the radical movement and by herself or who knows, same way with her discussions of her work on Hegel. Immensely, I mean, she was very modest about her knowledge of Hegel for many years. But then all of a sudden you see all this stuff come out. Anyway, the point is, is that she notices that she's smart, reading careful, Hegel carefully enough to know that this negation of the negation is absolute negativity. That's what negation negation is in, in Hegel. And there's many absolutes in Hegel in each one of his works, but they all are informed by negativity. So she realizes, but you can't have the dialectical method of negation of the negation without the absolute because the methodology is the concretization of the absolute. So the, the assumption that you get from angles onward uh, that the method is here and the system is there and, and there's a division between the two. We take the method, we forget the system. She says, well, let's take a look at that absolute to see if there's some content in there that is of liberatory import that is importance. And she's basically saying, uh, you don't just follow what Marx says to the letter. This is not what Marxism means. 
you rethink what Marxism means for your historical time. And that led to a very daring move on her part. She said, I'm going to go directly to Hegel's absolutes. Now, most other people laughed, right? Or just thought that was nuts. And probably most people still do. But uh, what helped her greatly is, again, Lenin. I will be brief here and conclude is that you've got to remember that um, no Marxist was discussing Hegel in a serious way prior to 1914. And definitely nobody would say anything about the absolute. Rosa Luxemburg, who I admire a very great deal, she used the word dialectic all the time. You're undialectical. You need to learn the dialectic, wah, wah, wah. There's no evidence I have ever found that she ever read Hegel seriously, if at all. Okay, It was just like a swear word. Um, and certainly the absolute, uh, Luxembourg wouldn't have cared <laughs> what is this, a code name for God or something. Um, but so when Lenin, in 1914, you realize it's World War I breaks out. His entire political life is shattered because his own comrades are now like the Mensheviks and the Social Democrats in Germany are supporting an imperialist war that ends up in the murder of 9 million people. It's got to shake you up. It shakes him up. What does he do? He goes to the library and studies Hegel for six months. And in those notes, which he's the first to translate, he says, gee whiz, the absolute in Hegel. Wow, that's, where the, that's really important. The absolute is very materialistic. People shouldn't reject this. Now, she didn't know much Hegel at the time. But when she saw that, she said, well, look, nobody can doubt that Lenin was not a practical politician. Even his biggest enemies are not going to say that. He was clearly a very practical man that lived for the revolution every day of his life. So if Lenin in the middle of World War I finds something of relevance in Hegel's absolutes, maybe we should look into this. <laughs> so she looked in. Okay, now to the question here that was posed about- We are, we are way much over time. Oh, I'm sorry, just one, one, one minute. Um, uh, about um, C.L.I. James and the notes on dialectics and leaps and the question of, trans uh, of uh, turning the imperialist war into a civil war. Uh, Donievskaya argued, uh, as James did uh, in some ways also at the time, that Lenin's breakthrough on Hegel in 1914 had a direct practical impact on his politics in 1917. He had always argued for a bourgeois democratic revolution up to that point. Uh, now he says, no, we can go beyond that. We can leap into the proletarian revolution uh, with his April thesis of 1917. So James makes a point in Notes on Dialectics that, oh, Hegel has this discussion of leaps in the dialectic, and this is what influenced uh, Lenin with his political declaration in the April Theses that we can now go directly to proletarian revolution. The problem with that, well, it, this may be something to that, but Dunievskaya's response to it was, uh, it's a little bit too jumping of, of applying the philosophy to the politics, because actually the question of leaps is found in the doctrine of essence of the logic, uh, and she was saying the more important part of Lenin's notes of, of, of Lenin's commentary on Hegel was the absolute, which James was not paying attention to. So even if it's true that that's where he got the notion from, it kind of missed the point of what we, what she thought was the most important point. Thank you, Peter. And I'm, just, I'm sorry um, we are, have been running um, a little bit behind time. So we will start the next session at. Um, 35 minutes after the hour. So in five minutes, in five, sorry, seven minutes by my count. Thank you. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. And everybody else. <clears throat>